love. It's quite the word. And from a cultural perspective, I don't think there's any word in the English language that's been more stripped of its depth than the word love. Many tend to view the love of God in the same way as popular music and art and literature by making it their own definition. God's love, however, is much different in how great his love is. There are no words to describe its depth and its intensity and ultimately how it affects us. But Scripture gives us insight of how important it is. Jeremiah 31.3, The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. In John 13, 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay his life for his, down for his friends. Psalm 86, 15, But you, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And perhaps the one that everybody knows and he explains love to a T, though. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God's love is so different from what we think it is. Even if we don't understand the magnitude of his love yet or ever. The only way that we will ever feel a depth of love that God has actually given to us is if we draw near to him. And then he draws near to us. And then we begin to feel this change. It's something that's so intense. But for every human being, you guys, desires to be loved. You know, that's really the way in to share with people about God. Is you can talk to them on any level. Theology, which would matter nothing to them. They might raise their um, problems that they've heard on, on, online or through Facebook. It's such, such a reliable source. Right. Every every challenge to the gospel about how it, it contradicts one in a, it, it itself has been refuted time and time again. It's not like somebody's bringing up a new challenge against the word of God. But ultimately, when you want to talk to somebody about the truth of God, you just need to talk about the fact that they need to be loved, and that God can fill a love with them better than any human being can. We all try to make love what we think it should be. Sometimes we go outside of our own realm and do stupid things. And we figure out that real, true love is only from God. The love of God is in a class all by itself, and it changes our life when we surrender to it. And yet, it is a love that he shares in part with us and expects us to share with each other. That's a big thing. We have to share it with one another. As we gather today on this Christmas day, and we'll observe some of the most intriguing por points and portions around the birth of our Lord, this day we celebrate is really grounded in a gift called love. When the Son of God stepped out of heaven, assumed the role in human flesh, coming to earth for our redemption, that's real love. Let's open with prayer, please. Father God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together, to serve you together. Thank you for the um, gathering together of people today from both first and second services. This is really, truly what your church is about, is one, one gathering of people. So we're grateful, Lord, that you have bestowed this upon us this morning to gather. For those who are not here with us, who are traveling or home or ill, may you please be with each one of them and just let them fill your, your presence. We pray, God, that you would open our ears to hear your word this morning and write your words upon our hearts strengthening us to go out into the world and become um, who you want us to really, truly be. Let us not get in the way of that. And let me not get in the way of your message going forward. May you please pray, I pray that you would please speak by way of the Spirit through me this morning, Lord God, from this pulpit to your children, all for your glory, that I don't get in the way of what you are doing in your people. In your precious holy name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn to Luke 2. If you have them with you, if not, it'll be on the screen that's here in the sanctuary behind me as well as on the uh, presentation screen at home. I'm going to read two, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 to begin. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus and that all the world 
should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was, from the, was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. For those of you who do not know what that word betrothed means, it means engaged. That's what we commonly call it now. The irony is, is not all, you know, life hasn't always been what we think it is. And betrothed, when you were betrothed or, or wed to be wed to somebody else, you were already technically in marriage. This decree that was sent out by Caesar Augustus was common. It was a population roll call. And a national census, a regional census, is still done to this day. We have an American census, the U.S. Census. You get your card and you have to fill it out. That's how the government can keep track of people, at least the best as possible. Um, this is another fascinating truth about Scripture is that it's actually recording this here. And you're thinking, why, why would, you know, when I'm reading the Bible, why do I need to hear about a, a decree made about this census being taken Well, when it's also recorded in Roman history and it's recorded in Jewish history, not just the biblical history, doesn't that kind of corroborate that the Bible is accurate? Absolutely it does. So the more that we we, we investigate this, we find out that this we know the exact year this happened because of this statement at the beginning of Luke chapter 2. Just fascinating. But what's more important here is that Mary and Joseph had to travel back to be registered. They were engaged, which, like I said, is as good as being married without the benefits of being married. Many naysayers have a hard time with this fact, but it shouldn't be that hard to believe because if you were Jewish anyway, there's so much um, intertwined with understanding when a person was betrothed. You didn't do anything until your actual ceremony especially in light of seeing the full interaction of the word of God and not just one portion, we have to see something else. So she's pregnant with a child, which isn't Joseph's. And we think, well, wait a minute. That's, first of all, it's impossible. Okay, well, it's a supernatural. This is the Holy Spirit coming across and and Mary and giving her a child. But then we think, well, this has got to be Joseph and how is he cool with it? Well, he wasn't. We're going to go to Matthew 1, 18 through 25 for a moment. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit before they came together, which means intimacy. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. It says husband because they are engaged. That is the title given Wife and husband, even though they're not yet together, okay? But he also considered these things, behold, uh, as he considered these things, because he was ready to divorce her quietly and not shame her. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Knew her not. What does that mean? Exactly. He knew her not. He was not intimate with her, okay? Now, there's a display of of this uh, selfless love here that is truly one way that God's love is is far superior than the world's love. Joseph was ready to be done. And I don't think anybody here, any guy could, you know, feel the same way. If you're engaged to be married, you know, you have a love of your life and you're ready to be married and you're in that young puppy love stage and then she's pregnant with another dude's baby, so we think. But God does something here. He was going to be respectable and respectful about how he you know, departed, and he parted ways with her. 
But God knew how Joseph would feel. Now, here's the thing. He sends an angel to tell him what he needs to know. This wasn't done to save Joseph's feelings. God's will is being done regardless of your feelings. However, isn't it just like our God, because we don't know the full conversation here of what was said, or the full feeling and the impact that the Holy Spirit had upon Joseph to calm his nerves and let him know that what he heard in this dream from this angel was in fact from God. Because when he woke, he agreed to it. It doesn't say how he reacted. It says he agreed to it. But isn't it just like our God to probably calm him down a little bit or a lot a little bit? You feel what I'm saying? Amen? You know, he, there's got to be something here where Joseph wakes up and he's like, okay, okay. Which does what? Makes Joseph the greatest bonus daddy ever. Amen? We continue with Luke 6 and 7. While they were there, this time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. All kings are considered royalty and they are born as such. But as I mentioned briefly in our Christmas Eve service last night, there's this ultimate display of humility here that we see given to us right here beginning with this comment. Now, royalty is birthed accordingly, right? A king would be born into a royal family and there's a big to-do and there's an announcement and trumpets and then, you know, horses on chariots going out to tell everybody of what's happening and what did happen. Now we have Facebook to let everybody know you know, how far along. And ladies, can I ask you a question? If you get pregnant, quit telling us how many weeks along you are because this guy's got to do math. <laughs> so how, how are you doing? How are you feeling? 31 weeks. Oh! How many of those months were five weeks long, right? <laughs> Next thing in the world, it's like, how, how many months are you? And I love it when women now will go like, I'm beginning my third trimester. Score. Thank you. That's like seven months. <laughs> Don't give us math. But there's this beauty here in humility where, where we, we see this with all the royalty and all the things, the way we, we, they had no room at the hotel. You can go stay in the manger. My wife's getting ready to give birth. Are you serious? But, he, you know, who knows what that conversation went like. But they went to the, they went to the stable. And there was born a child. Our Savior born in a stable. This, my friends, was by design. This wasn't an accident. This was by design. Why? Because Christ is showing you something here. He's showing you humility in a world that doesn't have it. In a world that lacks humility, we have humility in Christ. Now, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, there's something else here. So I want, I want to go through 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the, Lord, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. What a sight. What a sound this must have been. What a moment. The angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. You're out there in the Flint Hills shepherding your flock, right? A couple guys staying awake to make sure that the herd doesn't go running away and an angel appears. And it says they were filled with great fear. Yeah, they were filled with great fear. Who wouldn't be? 
upon y'all. Amen. Somebody, y'all be tripping. <laughs> you know? Could you imagine, though, the, the glory of the heavenly host, the multitude of angels singing to them, singing to them? When the angels went away from them into heaven, that's a trip. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And, then they, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, and it had been told as it had been told them. Human fear was in the shepherds. Yeah. Went away with haste means they booked it out of there. When you make haste, you're on the run. They just heard and saw something fascinating and were instructed what to do. As soon as those angels went to heaven, they were like, how fast can you run? They couldn't run fast enough to get there. The Lord directed them by the Spirit to get there. And when they saw what they saw, they knew what was truth. They were told by the angel, they find the stable and they find this husband and wife and some cattle, and donkeys, whatever, camels, whatever other indigenous you know, animals are hanging out in the stable in the middle of the east. And they find this baby wrapped in swaddling claws. You know what swaddling claws are? They're not clothes. They're the junk, whatever you can grab. Right? You go to the shop and you're changing your oil and you get oil on your hand, you grab the dirtiest rag. That's what they wrapped this baby in. You think about that for a minute. Shirt size doesn't fit right. Our favorite shirt isn't clean. We're yelling. The king that made everything wrapped in nasty clothes called a cloth. That's humility. That's what we mean by humility. It's by design. Verse 19 is so important not to overlook, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She didn't know. She knew, but she didn't know. You know? She'd been visited. She knew. She went and saw Elizabeth. The baby leapt, you know, in the womb. There's all these things that point here. But they, she stored them up in their heart. Then, this is where it gets interesting. Luke 21 Luke 2, 21. At the end of eight days when he was circumcised, which is traditional by Hebrew um, understanding, he was called Jesus. By the way, that happened to me too. Couldn't have been in the hospital. My parents took me back on the eighth day. Jonathan, why? Why would they possibly wait? Except it wasn't a decree from Hebrew families. <sighs> My mom's like, you screamed really loud. <laughs> That's because it's day eight. <laughs> day eight, ma. The name was given, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. They were told what the name of the baby would be. Joseph and Mary had no say in the name that was given, but they honored what the angel told them, which was given to them by God. His name is Jesus. Okay. And when the time came, for their purification according to the law of Moses, tradition, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Okay? And you offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in, uh, who, was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of, of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And he came in the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, listen to this, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now pause there for a moment. Simeon gets it. He wasn't going to die. He wasn't going to die until he got to see the Lord's Christ. He knew who that baby was, that eight-day-year-old baby, eight-day-old baby, right? Probably still screaming from having to wait till the eighth day to get circumcised. But he takes that baby and he blesses the Lord. And this is beautiful that he states this. He says this, and he includes Gentiles and for your people Israel. And his father and mother, in verse 33, marveled at what he was said about him. Marveled at what he said. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. What a spoken word from Simeon. The wise man, Simeon, blesses him and shows him something here. I mean, could you imagine being new parents and having somebody so wise saying something so intense upon you about your own kid? Amen? And here's why this is all so important. Not only is it what the word tells us, it's also what we need to know about what we believe in Jesus. I told everybody last night, do we minimize who Christ really is? You know, we want to talk to God and talk about Jesus. Jesus intercedes for us. We talk to Jesus to get to God. Nobody can get to the Father except through me. Jesus says this. Why is this so significant? Because what we read last night in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, shows us that the world was created through and for him through him and for him. He has been part of the Godhead since before we were even thought of. We can't get our heads wrapped around that because we have to think of everything we're having a start date, right? And an expiration date. But God always has been and always will be. What's so hard for us to get our heads wrapped around that? It's beautiful and it's intense and it's real. And on this Christmas day, based on the love of God and what he did here to prove points about who he was, that is Jesus. There are three more presents that I want to unwrap for you, okay? And they all come from one verse, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope, okay? Okay? So love has been given to you. The love of God has been given to you. It is here for the taking. We'll wrap up with that in a moment. But three small gifts. One is, but they're huge, hope. What do we live for? What do, what do we live for? In that statement, the hope fill you. Holy Spirit may abound in hope. Why, why hope? What, what, what else do you got? What else do you have in this world that gives you hope? How about those people who've saved their whole life in their retirement only to die the day before their retirement? Is that what you were hoping for? You know, 66 years old, you're hoping to hit the greens. And you don't make it. What was your hope? What do you hope for that once a year vacation? What's a vacation? <laughs> Amen, somebody. I don't go nowhere. It's okay. Can I, I don't like going anywhere. I like home, you know. But seriously, what is the hope we live for? It's got to be in something much greater than ourselves in this world. He has given us a reason to live, and his spirit is a down payment on the rest of your life. Listen to me this morning. It's a down payment. 
It's an earnest payment. The Holy Spirit is the helper. He gave it to you and I. He gave it to us as a down payment that he is resting assured that we will be with him forever when we die. Either when we die or when he returns to set up his eternal kingdom, whichever comes first. So far, it's been about all of us dying. And as we rate we're going, we're gonna probably still all die before this ever happens. But it's okay because we know that one day it will occur because that's his promise. But the more that days go by that you're just sitting there going, wow, I can't believe Jesus hasn't come back yet. Well, that's not the way to live your life either. Get busy living, get busy dying. Look, man, it's gonna happen. It's a promise. It's a hope we have. In the meantime, quit your belly aching and get busy living for him, man. He promises to never leave you nor forsake you. We are his and whomever belongs to him will never lose, ever, ever lose. Number two is the joy. The world chases after happiness like they've never had it. But nothing, and I mean nothing, will fill the God-shaped hole in your heart like the joy of the Lord. Many of you are pondering some changes in the new year because you have fallen into sinful patterns and you want them to stop and you want to change. Some of us have been in that this year, right? We're always fighting. Temptation's something that's real and sometimes we give into temptations and we're stupid for doing it and then we've got to stop and realize the, the weight of what is here. But let me tell you something. When you're struggling, wondering whether, whether it's any use to live, here's your second Christmas present. Christ not only came to destroy the works of the devil, our sinning, he also came to advocate for us because of experiences of failure in our fight. And you think, man, I'm just not strong enough to do this. I, I just can't make it through this life. There's no possible way, pastor, that you understand what I'm going through and there's no way out of this. But I must tell you, yes, there is a way out of this and yes, you are valuable enough to make it through this. Because we're told in scripture that the joy of the Lord is our strength. How about we start and end there? You know? How about we start and end there? So I plead with you, let the fact that failure will not have the last word, but remind you of your frailty. Number three, peace. Christ came to destroy sin and death, meaning to save us by forgiving of our sins, and defeating death so that we do not have to pay for our iniquities at our death with eternal damnation, which we righteously and so deservedly so have inherited. Instead, those who repent and believe are sealed by God's righteous decree. Not a climbing of a ladder, just telling God, you're sorry. I'm sorry for being a sinner, and I believe you. Can I start there? Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't flip zero to 60 in religiosity. <laughs> you can. You just look like a fool doing it. Anybody else have this problem happen to them when they became a believer in like, let's say 1987, 88, somewhere in there? <laughs> and you were going to a Pentecostal church and they told you that you had to get rid of all that devil music he was listening to. Well, what's wrong with anthrax, <laughs> you know? Well, everything's wrong with that. Get rid of it all. I quit listening to that, read the Bible all the time, stopped hanging around with all the friends I had because that's what they told me at that church that I had to do. That lasted about two and a half months, and I can't believe I made it two and a half months. And after that, I was like, there's no way that I'm doing this if this is what God's all about. Does that sound remotely familiar to anybody? It's not about religiosity, you guys. It's about the truth of Christ changing you and I. It's about the truth of Christ changing who we are. Amen? And when we have a gift, a gift here of peace given to us, we know that it's not about what, we, what we've done. It's about what we go do from this day forward. I always tell you, you guys, Tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life. Have any of you messed up? <laughs> Have any of you messed up really bad all this year? Hey, Amen, everybody. But how bad was it? You want to weigh it up against other people's? Doesn't matter. 
If you sin, you sin. You have a redeemer in Christ Jesus. Here's the thing. Stop doing it. Okay, well, how do I do that? It takes a lot of work. But you can't do it apart from him. That's the beauty of God. He gives you a peace knowing that when you draw near to him, you can stop whatever you're dealing with. And you're still going to fail. You, your goal is to fail less. <laughs> I told my kids growing up, just suck less. <laughs> just tell them baseball players that. Just how do I get better at batting? Just suck less, kid. Just it doesn't help to, you know, but here's the thing I always tell those kids, even at 15 and 16, get the bat off your shoulder. Swing. Amen? Do something. You got to try. This is life. Swing. If you miss, you miss. At least you're swinging. Go down swinging. Amen? You're not going to fail unless you try. Failure is a natural part. How many times have we heard that Thomas Edison failed 99 times of making a light bulb? He probably failed more than that. Thank God he didn't quit. Otherwise, we're sitting completely in candlelight. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. But God gives you love and peace and joy and hope, and that's the story of the advent. All those come from God through Christ Jesus who restores you and I. This is a love in which we cannot fathom. It's a love that is very intentional by God. And in closing, I'll say this. Our Savior demands that we love him above all else because when we do, we can truly understand that hope, joy, and peace that's available to every one of us. Amen? And Christ demands that we love him far more than we love any other person, and indicating his equality with God. He's the God man, the final revelation of our creator and the loving, uh, uh, loving uh, person above everyone else. He is, he is our maker, our creator. He is our light. And this is why you battle each and every day against sin. And this is how you can do it, how it's even remotely possible because of the birth of this child in a manger. Because of the birth of this child in a manger. Not only is love from God, but God is love. This began before the dawn of creation, but it's very evident, very evident. It's brought to a pinnacle on this day when we recognize today. You can't neglect everything that God has given to you. Amen? It's gotta start somewhere. I remember um, this moment. Um, I think Christmas made an impact on me. I mean, you know, you always enjoyed as a kid growing up and all that. But in July of 83, my mom dies, and I move out here. And uh, about a little over a year later, my dad dies. And I'm getting, a legally, I'm getting legally adopted by my stepmother. She's going through this process, so I had to go through the adoption process. And there's a fight over me. One of my older brothers and her, they're fighting over who's going to have me. And he wanted me back in California, and she wanted me here. And uh, that was what my dad and my mom at made her promise to them. So she's trying to fulfill his promise. So there's this tug of war. Can't even talk about my family at this point. Then I lose my brother, Dennis, who I was really close to a couple months after my dad. And this is really, I'm just this lost kid. But what was worst about this is that my stepmom lost her husband, and she was gone. She was gone for a while. She checked out. One day she got in the car, said, I'm going for a drive. Called us three days later in Oregon. <laughs> you know, she's hurt. She was hurting for certain. And I remember that Christmas, she wasn't going to put up nothing. No Christmas music, no tree, no nothing. So I put this tree up. It was this fake tree. And I strung all the lights I found in this box all over the living room. And I got up every morning at like 6 o'clock in the morning School was down. A bus picked us up. I got picked up by, at CJ's house at like 7.15. I got up at 6 o'clock, and I would just sit and stare at these Christmas lights. My life was in complete disarray. I mean, gone. 
And I remember like having this peace from God every morning getting up, staring at those Christmas lights. Christmas took on a whole new meaning because I found this hope in what I didn't have yet. When I became a believer a couple of years later, it's like I was fully restored. And all those empty nights and empty days and all that loneliness truly began to go away. Do I still struggle with loneliness sometimes? I have separ- you don't think I have separation anxiety issues? <laughs> That's what happens when you lose everybody you know before you're a 13-year-old, right? But I'm not crying about it. I've gotten better at it. But how have I gotten better at it? Through Christ. He restores you and I through everything we ever go through. It might not be right now, but it might be tomorrow. Just don't lose hope. That's why we say don't lose hope. He gives us a peace. He gives us a joy. He gives us love. He is the God of all creation. I still stare at lights, but not quite the way I once did because I have a better feeling about them when I look at them now, right? This morning, thank you for being here with us as we celebrate the Lord's Day together. And I pray that you remember, truly remember going forward what he is really all about. I live each and every one of you, and I'm praying for each and every one of you, and let's close in prayer together today. Father, thank you for bringing us all together, and thank you for giving us the chance to celebrate on your day. This is the first time, Father, that I've been a pastor on your actual day of Christmas Day being on a Sunday. And this was fun. And uh, Lord God, but more than anything, more than fun, this has been an honor to come before you, kneel before your throne and worship you as every Lord's Day should be. But more than that, Lord, every day should be. Every day is a gift that you have given to us. Let us not waste it anymore. Let us get off the bench and start swinging. Start swinging at every ball pitch to us. We don't care what we do. We don't care how we fail, but we've got to do something, and we've got to turn away from ourselves, what we've been doing wrong and all of our sin and temptation and run into your arms and try to do better. I pray, Lord God, that you be with each person that's here. Bless them and love them. In your precious holy name, we thank you, Jesus. Amen.